My name is Lynette Williams. I'm from the city of Gross Point Farms. My, I'm going to talk to you today about the corruption in the Wayne County Probate Court as well as the Circuit Court of the State of Michigan. And this is a case about fraud, racketeering, embezzlement, corruption, and violations of individual civil and constitutional rights. You know, this system that we have was intended to protect innocent people to find people that were guilty of crimes guilty and punish them. That's not how it works. Victims hide. Victims are victimized more. Well, you're supposed to represent the Constitution of America, and you're not doing it. So if you're not ready to represent the Constitution, you need to step down. We need to elect people that's going to represent the Constitution and protect the rights of all citizens. There are too many people are crying out in America and it's time that the lawless in America stop. Bank of America, America has literally put me in this situation of a foreclosure. Crystal Price is one of many thousands of victims of the home foreclosure fraud. In this case, the criminal perpetrators appear to be corporate and government enterprises working together through their corporate officials and attorneys, Bank of America, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, and other money lenders money launderers and their agents and attorneys who are using color of law and the complicit executive and judicial branches of local state and federal government to steal property and shelter from crystal and other unsuspecting homeowners so far we have seen that in their typically deceptive fashion Lawyers are working under the pretext that they are honestly and lawfully servicing the legitimate foreclosure needs of their client, which in this case was Bank of America. Trot and Trot looks to have taken advantage of Crystal's situation of going through an already painful divorce and arranging with Bank of America for a modification of her mortgage payments as otherwise required by Bank of America under the terms of the 2008 and 2009 bank bailouts. It is a common but unlawful practice called dual tracking, a tactic that Bank of America intentionally implemented to increase profits. The foreclosure mill, like Trot and Trot, works with the mortgage servicer like Bank of America that, in turn, is working on behalf of the mortgage lender which is the government-sponsored enterprise of Freddie Mac, all working together to trick the homeowner into believing that they are working to keep them in their home while moving ahead with foreclosure proceedings anyway. In the meantime, though Crystal had been continuing to make her timely monthly mortgage payments, Trot and Trot attorneys as foreclosure mill specialists working on Bank of America's behalf came in the side door working recklessly to unlawfully remove Crystal from her home, using what clearly appears to be the same type of criminal tactics by which Bank of America was committing against many thousands of other homeowners about this same time, as exposed by federal whistleblower Gregory Mackler. Crystal Price, understandably, was not going to let her home go so easily, however. She fought back with the criminal's own incriminating documentation. She has shown us how Trot and Trot attorneys have incorporated notary fraud gross negligence and simple greed into their modus operandi by claims to be representing the wrong legal entity of the too-big-to-fail Bank of America, while wrongly spelling the price name as Prince on foreclosure documents and in legal proceedings by listing the wrong parcel number on legal contracts and sheriff's deeds, and in short, failing to implement proper procedural step while otherwise citing legal ease or color of law as their justification. Folks, this is nothing short of evidence of criminal intent and criminal behavior that we can show is shared between the offices of the Wayne County Sheriff, the Wayne County Register of Deeds, the Wayne County Circuit Court, and the Wayne County Clerk, 
all taking place within the purview of the Deed Fraud Task Force and the Wayne County Prosecutor. Take a look and you'll see what Crystal Price saw over the course of the past four years that she had been fighting this racketeering and corruption by corporate and government enterprises. Is liberty living in a democracy where the majority who vote get their way? Is liberty going along to get along even when it means taking away the liberty of others for the greater good? The National Liberty Alliance is on a mission to restore sovereign power and a republic back to the people. Through education and knowledge of the founding principles upon which this great nation of the United States was founded. Check it out. NationalLibertyAlliance.org In this segment, we pick up from our last discussion about how Crystal Price's documents reveal the means and the modus operandi by which we summarized that she was victimized by criminal racketeers disguised as legitimate government departments, courts, foreclosure specialists, law firms, and banking mega corporations. Crystal's case started when Trot and Trot moved forward with foreclosure proceedings and a lawsuit against Crystal while acting as the agent for Bank of America, a mortgage servicer, and Freddie Mac, the new government owner, after Trot and Trot and Bank of America worked together to defraud Crystal out of her home using a scheme called dual tracking and then filed suit against Crystal on behalf of Freddie Mac to have her evicted from the home that was rightfully hers. As shown already, Trot and Trot and Bank of America and the Wayne County Sheriff's Department, as shown only thus far to a lesser extent, used public postings and falsified documents, such as this sheriff's deed, in which Felicia Mac represents herself as being the deputy sheriff, Yet by FOIA request from Crystal Price, the Wayne County Circuit Court Clerk has determined there is no such official appointment of Felicia Mack as Deputy Sheriff. Notary Fraud Shall we try to reason how Felicia Mack's identity as a Sheriff's Deputy was certified by Yolanda Diaz as being a he? When Yolanda Diaz is also filling out other similar sheriff's deeds by having her signature notarized by others as also being a sheriff's deputy acting in the same capacity to steal homes from unsuspecting taxpayers? These people are using only the color of law, something like smoke and mirrors, to defraud the government, the public, the courts, and Crystal Price herself, eventually taking her home and attempting finally to have her evicted and put out on the streets like so many other victims of this operation taking place in Michigan and across America. Now we begin a closer look at the documents proving the felony racketeering that is operating in full view of the public, but masked as legitimate legal banking and foreclosure proceedings, law enforcement, and due process court hearings, all together used instrumentally to torment and to traumatize Ms. Price, as well as so many other innocent people, while otherwise blaming these victims for their own victimization. As shown in the previous segment, Crystal has long been notifying judicial authorities about these crimes, including lawyers and judges, who otherwise have the responsibility of issuing warrants for the minimal purpose of conducting judicial inquiries based upon criminal allegations, as shown under Michigan's Code of Criminal Procedure, MCL 764.1a, to which even federal judges are also compelled to adhere. Now, I don't want to go too far off track, presenting you with the minute details of this case, but I must also present to you, the viewers, with the scope of this racketeering and criminal cover-up that is going on in Wayne County. Here is one of Crystal's federal case filings, showing that she not only notified a tribunal of judges at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, that she, as well as the people of the state of Michigan and of the United States, were the victims of fraud upon the lower federal court. 
But here, she is also describing how she had additionally notified the local 34th District Court in Wayne County about this fraud, and both times to no avail. Without going off on a tangent or into the proverbial rabbit hole, let's take a brief look at how this 34th District Court judge, Brian Oakley of Wayne County, treated Miss Price after he himself had previously committed other crimes against Crystal, which we will get into shortly to demonstrate how judges in Wayne County are also aiding and abetting in the execution of these foreclosure crimes and thefts upon people's homes. Here's a 2014 hearing transcript for the lower court case Crystal is writing about to the U.S. Court of Appeals, the federal case also being ruled upon by the Sixth Circuit judges Batchelder, Boggs, and Clay in 2014. The backstory for this hearing transcript is that it pertains to the 34th District Court Judge Oakley placing a stay of proceedings on the original case brought against Crystal Price by Freddie Mac presumably to cover up the judge's criminal involvement in the foreclosure proceedings on behalf of Freddie Mac, by this judge, Brian Oakley, having unilaterally written two separate orders of the court in early 2012, both in favor of Freddie Mac and placing Ms. Price at a distinct legal disadvantage, and while denying both Crystal and her attorney their right to due process hearing before signing these unlawful orders. Fortunately, the transcripts demonstrate the offensive temperament and the crooked disposition of this 34th District Court Judge, Brian Oakley, who, here in the transcript, is disguised by the court reporter's wording as the court. As if this judge should have no personal accountability whatsoever for his own criminal actions from the bench, while merely acting on behalf of the people of the state of Michigan as if he were honoring his sworn oath of judicial office. Here, Crystal is protesting the underlying nature of the events supporting the previous two full years of her indenturing and struggle to keep her home, as based upon Oakley's fraudulent actions of separating Crystal's counter-complaint from the original action brought against her by Trot and Trot attorneys, who were all acting on behalf of Freddie Mac without any form of due process or a proper hearing. In effect, this March 3, 2014 hearing was the first time ever that Crystal Price or any of the attorneys for either side had been before any judge in any court since all this was started against her by Trot and Trot and Bank of America in late 2010 and early 2011. The fact is that in order to stop what had amounted to two full years of additional fraud committed by Trot and Trot attorneys in the federal courts and in the state circuit court, Crystal needed to have this 34th district judge address the unlawfulness of what occurred two years prior in 2012. She needed to move the original case forward to challenge the process by which Trot and Trot and their corporate clients had illegally communicated with this 34th District Court judge to create fraudulent documents with reference to a so-called hearing that otherwise never ever took place. So the first point of the hearing should have been how this original case had become unlawfully stayed for the previous two years while Crystal's original arguments against that case placed in the form of a counter-complaint against the original case, were ushered away to play out in other county and federal courts so as to dilute, complicate, and neutralize Crystal's arguments, and so to either force her into financial submission to the never-ending fight, and or to slowly render her arguments impotent by means of fraud by trot and trot attorneys and other corruption by other judges and court officials. The second point of Crystal's moving for a hearing was to force the court, and thus the public record of court proceedings, to acknowledge the unlawfulness of the court's previous actions, i.e. Oakley's previous aiding and abetting through fraud upon the court, by his having provided such an order in 2012 to separate the original case against Crystal and Crystal's counter-complaint against Freddie Mac and their trot and trot attorneys, without a proper hearing. 
Thirdly, and this is an interesting testament on just how wrong judges can act and still torturously get away with their criminal wrongdoings in favor of crooked big businesses, banks, and corporations, including favoritism towards government corporations and against we the people. Thirdly, Crystal was seeking to have this judge address the fact that when criminally writing the unlawful 2012 order, he had officialized the order naming Fannie Mae as the plaintiff and not Freddie Mac, essentially making the order void on its face since the government corporation of Fannie Mae has never, ever been a party to this action. Clearly, Judge Oakley understood why Crystal Price had brought this hearing in which her former husband was also being represented in court by his attorney, who otherwise remained silently watching as the events of the hearing unfolded. The transcripts show, though Judge Oakley asked the party to bring him up to date at the start of the hearing, Oakley quickly interrupted the trot and trot attorney to speak directly to Crystal Price, saying, It's a typo, Miss Price, referring to his wrongly placing the name of Fannie Mae on the 2012 order underlying Crystal's previous two years of constant battering by trot and trot in the state circuit and federal courts. Without allowing Crystal to have her equal turn after the trot and trot lawyer Matthew Levine in bringing this judge up to date from another, more truthful perspective, Oakley interrupted the trot and trot attorney to address Crystal directly, saying, I'll amend that order if it makes you feel more comfortable. This judge was clearly being sarcastic and using passive aggression against Ms. Price in a blatant attempt to cover up his previous crimes of 2012 against her. Crystal objected to such a proposal by the judge because she recognized that amending the order amounted to officializing the criminal cover-up of what Oakley had previously done. Judge Oakley's response, meanwhile, and without the stated all due respect towards Crystal, was to state simply, it's my order so I'll do whatever I damn well please with my order. So much for the court being the one issuing that previous 2012 order. This statement by Judge Brian Oakley shows that he saw himself then in 2012 and again now in 2014 as above the law. It also underscores his actually having full accountability for his own criminal actions, even as they were executed, whether on or off the bench, outside of his judicial capacity, being personal acts for which judicial immunity is not to be provided. Both then and now, despite that Oakley was trying to deliver the false appearance of acting within his judicial capacity, he appears to have been otherwise acting criminally in a conspiracy and under color of law, a violation of the United States Federal Code 18 U.S.C. sections 241 and 242 to again deny Ms. Price her right to due process. Ms. Price had no choice under this judge's stern language but to submit with humility and respect to the judicial bench, and as a devout Christian, to submit a modest protest against Judge Oakley swearing at her disrespectfully. Judge Oakley didn't miss a beat, however, in driving Ms. Price right back into what appears to be her place at this hearing, a place this Judge Oakley treated as being inferior because she was standing on her own as a pro se litigant, without an expensive attorney as a fellow member of the club known as the State Bar of Michigan, consisting of judges and attorneys who are railroading our state and federal courts throughout Michigan, and indeed by their affiliation with the American Bar Association, railroading all the courts of this nation. Clearly, this 34th District Court Judge Brian Oakley had forgotten that it was Crystal's taxes that were being used to pay this judicial scumbag's yearly salary for the previous two years of turmoil he had personally caused upon her, and I'm sure many more others before and after her. As these hearing transcripts show, Crystal Price kept her composure. Overlooking the fact that this judge said he will do as he wants by amending his two-year-old unlawful order naming the wrong plaintiff, Fannie Mae, Crystal instead delves straight in to tactfully confront this judge with acting unlawfully and in such fashion as to aid and abet in the criminal fraud that took place in his court two years earlier in 2012. 
and the fraud that has taken place ever since then by the trot and trot attorneys as they continued to lie, cheat, and steal her rightful property using their status as officers of the courts and using other state and federal courts as mere instruments for their continued conspiracy to use color of law to deprive Ms. Price of her constitutionally guaranteed due process rights. Per the transcripts, having caught the judge's attention, Oakley asked what her two motions were all about, right before he then impatiently pressured her to quickly answer his question, and as she was making clear that she was reaching for her documents to meet his pressured demand that she clearly and concisely answer his question, an answer he should have already known in the first place since Crystal's motion documents had been filed with the court well ahead of this particular hearing. The transcripts clearly show how this Judge Oakley used intimidation tactics in abuse of his authority in attempt to disrupt Miss Price's focus and to throw her off as she got out her two written motions and attempted to distinguish between the two sets of documents. Oakley thus barked, You don't know why you're here? when she had otherwise just finished telling him why she was there. These transcripts show that Crystal Price no more than read the title of the first motion when Judge Oakley prejudicially denied that motion and demanded that Crystal get the next motion out in front of him. He did so clearly without giving Crystal the opportunity to support her claims or to get anything else into the official record of this oral hearing. Importantly, Judge Oakley denied this motion at which point Crystal brought up the fraud upon that court making it incumbent upon this judge under MCL 764.1a to find reasonable cause that a crime had been committed by him, a task that any self-regulating, self-policing, and self-reporting government agent is bound by his oath of office to execute, even if against himself. This judge's behavior was clearly arrogant. The transcripts revealed that he was using Crystal's thoughtful and effortful written motions as figurative targets for shooting practice. Put the next sitting duck up there to shoot down was the message that he was sending to Crystal Price, without regard to her previous two years of court struggle and three years of accumulated damage at this point, as a direct cause of this hodgepodge of trot and trot attorneys and this judicial imposter acting as if they were otherwise legitimate judicial officers operating in Wayne County, Michigan. The transcript shows that this judge's demeanor towards Crystal went well beyond tort to be a criminal violation of her due process rights. As a self-defense expert, research, and book author on crime victimization, and a 30-year veteran of victims' rights advocacy and activism, I can tell you that Judge Oakley's behaviors from the bench also demonstrate the classic pattern of the victimizer blaming the victim. Here, the transcripts show that he flagrantly informed Crystal that he will deny any motion that she will bring to his court, reminding her of his previous abuse of power against her while saying that she had been the one to ask for it, then giving her the option of speaking up for more of the same, and then delivering upon her more criminal abuse from the bench. The transcripts show that this judicial criminal led Crystal Price down a dark path and refused to allow her to state her purpose, again in answer to this judge's own inquiry only moments before. He pressured her to reopen a case that only this judge and his fellow conspirators with Trot and Trot must have believed was closed two years earlier when they unlawfully took her counterclaims through the Wayne County Circuit Court and then into the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Michigan, believing that she would never survive the cost of all this litigation and be forced to capitulate and otherwise accept a measly $4,000 to walk away from her house, similarly to how Letitia Edgar stated that she was offered $2,000 to walk away from her house around this same time. Fast forward to 2011, and that's when um, we received this envelope on the um, the front porch uh, from Manny Hammond, uh, Elegant Real Estate, or something like that, and uh, he had documents in there from Bank of America, which we had never dealt with. Um, saying uh cash for um cash for keys you get two thousand dollars to turn in your keys or whatever 
Note that this is another tangent I could take regarding Ms. Price's own attorney participating in the scheme to first defraud and then to extort Crystal out of her home. But that information will be saved for the next segment about this case. For now, it should suffice that this 34th District Court judge, Oakley, had momentarily forgotten that what he had otherwise planned to be a closed original case was actually only stayed by his fraudulent sui sponte order, done without any hearing whatsoever. How do we know that there was no actual hearing on this action by the judge that damaged Crystal Price relentlessly for the following two years? And how do we know that the order signed by Brian Oakley was fraudulent and that he was acting outside of his judicial capacity? It's simple, because Crystal Price did her homework and got the proof of it. What does liberty mean to you? The price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Does it mean being able to vote as a Democrat or a Republican? The National Liberty Alliance emphasizes the exercise of your individual rights under common law. Check it out. NationalLibertyAlliance.org Welcome back. We will finish out this brief segment by introducing you to more hard evidence of document fraud by the lawyers at Trot and Trot Law Firm. Let's bear in mind that when such fraudulent documents are created for use in mortgage lending, it becomes mortgage fraud. And when used to foreclose upon homes, it becomes foreclosure fraud. When these documents are sent through the United States mail with the intent to defraud the recipient, it becomes mail fraud. And when emailed, faxed, or transferred through another form of electronic medium, it becomes wire fraud. When these documents are submitted to courts under lawyers' sworn oath of truthfulness under penalty of perjury as judicial officers, it becomes fraud upon the court. When submitted to the Register of Deeds office, it becomes deed fraud. And when any combination of people repeatedly engage in such conduct in commerce, the buying and selling of goods and services, particularly on a large scale, and with the intent to profit or to obtain a financial gain, such as by business occupation as a notary, a special sheriff's deputy, a lawyer, or a judge, it becomes criminal racketeering. So in the next segment, we answer more about what is going on with Crystal's case. We will also show and tell more about why Trot and Trot partnering attorney Kenneth Carell appears to have so many ways of signing his name on documents and tell you more about his history of employment as the vice president of MERS while apparently having the time to also work as an attorney for Trot and Trot. And we'll show you that the track record of signing documents by another Trot and Trot attorney Ellen Kuhn appears as inconsistent as Carell's from one document to the next. Additionally, we have a couple of other law firms to introduce to you, one being Orleans and Associates and the other being Dykema Gossett. We will connect the dots of these multi-level racketeering operations in Wayne and Oakland counties to GOP campaign financing and to the highest offices of the state, being the Michigan Attorney General, the Michigan Governor, and the Michigan Supreme Court, and the United States being the office of the U.S. Attorney and the U.S. District Courts and Sixth Circuit Courts. Clearly, there is a huge problem at all three of local, state, and federal levels of government being tied into this humongous corrupt organization using color of law to steal homes, property, reputations, and freedoms from the people of Michigan.